name is Jillian Gregory, and my contact information is on the last page of the PowerPoint. Um, at the end of this evening, I'm going to stay around and answer any questions that you may have collectively as a group, individually, but certainly if you process things and think of something tomorrow or next week, if you shoot me a quick email, um, I'm usually pretty good about getting back within 24 hours and I'll get you the answers if I have them, and if not, I know who to ask. Um, as Ms. Keller mentioned, my, I'm the Director of Testing, Research, and Evaluation for Leon County Schools, which is a whole bunch of work to say that historically my office is in charge of FCAT. And so what it looks like today is that FCAT has pretty much gone away, and in its place in reading and math is the new Florida Standards Assessment. For those of you who have children who are older or maybe have gone through the FCAT, the FCAT Science 2.0, that remains. So we have new standards, they were adopted last year, the Florida Standards in English Language Arts and Math. And so the old FCAT didn't align, didn't measure student performance on those standards. <coughs> the old FCAT measured student performance on the old standards, the Next Generation Sunshine State Standards. Therefore, when we adopted a new set of standards in the state of Florida, we needed to adopt a new uh, assessment instrument. And so the state of Florida adopted the Florida Standards Assessment it is produced and published by a company called AIR, the American Institute for Research. Um, we do have, for those of you, and I'm going to present information K-12 only because you may have children in older grades. I'm not going to dive deep into those uh, areas, but I do want you to kind of have a surface sense of what they're experiencing as well. Um, so for the first time, students in grades 11, so if you have a junior or niece and nephew, a junior, they will be taking an ELA test. So years past, the test 10th grade FCAT was the last FCAT the students take, took. This year, last year's 10th graders will be taking the 11th grade test. Similarly, Algebra 2 is a new test this year. So students enrolled in Algebra 2, and in high school, enrollment is generally driven by, uh, tests are driven by course type. So Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 have a new EOC tied to the new math standards. And then all of the ELAs will be administered in grades 3 through 11, with 11 being the new grade. Um, some of our EOCs, if you have middle school students who take civics, who are in civics classes, or are in science classes in the high school, like biology one, or, US, or social studies, like U.S. history, those EOCs are not changing. Those EOCs are still uh, aligned to the old standards, and so they can still continue to be used. <coughs> this graphic is a summary of essentially what I've just shared with you. So what does this look like for your third, fourth, or fifth grade student when it comes to math? At its core, they have between 60 and 64 items over two days and two test sessions. So session one will have between 30 and 32 items. Session two will have between 30 and 32 items. They will be administered on separate days. Fourth and fifth grade will have a paper-based test. I'm sorry, third and fourth grade will have a paper-based test. Fifth grade will have a computer-based test. In middle school, again, just to briefly make sure you have, if you have middle school students and you haven't been, I haven't been to your middle school yet, um, essentially CBT is computer-based, work folder is scratch paper. It's my world's version of scratch paper. That's what we call it. Um, and you can see where calculators are allowed to be used and where calculators are not allowed to be used. If your student is in a grade with a calculator, uh, a test that requires a calculator, the district provides the calculator to the student. Um, they are not allowed to use their own calculators. And of course assessments are longer if you've had students in end of course assessment classes like Algebra 1, Geometry, or um, Al well, Algebra 2 didn't have a test last year. It was a one day test. It is now a two day test for students in those grades. For ELA writing, and you, DeSoto Trail was in fact picked as a field test school. It was one of six elementary schools in Leon County who were picked to field test the writing assessment. That field test is not for the writing assessment that's going to be administered in a month. That field test is a field test of item performance for next year's assessments and beyond. So on the field test, there were six or seven different versions of a writing prompt, and how those how <coughs> students responded to those writing prompts uh, determined whether or not the items are considered high quality, and if they are high quality, they will be used. If they're low quality, they would not be used in future testing. This year, however, we have... Um, I, we have the prompts, the test is in a few short weeks, I think my last count is in 12 days. And so the writing um, is coming along for grades 4 and 5, it is paper based. Um, and the shift, if, you, if I had been here in September, you would have seen computer based for 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade for the writing test. 
In November, the state changed its position on the computer-based test for writing for students in elementary school and for students in early grades and middle school. So now, as we stand today, grades, students in grades 4, 5, 6, and 7 will take a paper-based assessment. Students in grades 8 through 11 will take a computer-based writing assessment. Um, I have had the um, opportunity truly to observe the administration of the paper-based test here at DeSoto Trail. I personally observe them as well as at other schools and the, at the other elementary schools and the middle schools. I had to tour schools for a few days. And um, the paper-based test, the students were, seemed to be very comfortable with the paper-based. Um, the students were using their planning sheets. Um, what there, there is a, it's a booklet that they get, and so there's a lot of flipping back and forth that the students are managing, but the planning sheet is there. The students are able to read through. It's, it's between two and five passages that the students are required to read, and then they have a prompt and then they have their actual um, lined paper to write their response on. If you've had students in grades four, eight, and 10 previously, when they took the <coughs> writing test, it really was, they opened a book and there was a box with type in it, and that type in the box was their prompt. And it was, you know, in elementary school generally, it was along the lines of, you know, tell me about a famous person you want to meet and why. Mm -hmm. Or tell me about, you know, uh, persuade, you know, a persuasive essay in and around whether or not you should have um, gum or candy should be allowed on campus. So in the past, if you, had, if you have a middle school student or fourth grade student or a fifth grade student last year, you're a fourth grade student, that was what their writing test looked like. This year's writing test is profoundly different. They will have between two and five reading passages of between probably 100 and 500 words. So they will open their book, they will see two, or two to five reading passages. They will read those reading passages. After they read the reading passages, there's another sheet of paper that has, it's, it's easily read, readable, but it has the directions for how to write an essay response, and then it has their prompt. So essentially, and I'm, make, I'm making this up, but you know, it could be um, in fourth grade, something about Florida history, the Florida Panther, and a timeline. And so with a, a caption underneath it. And so the essay could be, um, explain how, you know, and the timeline has the dec decline of the Florida po panther population. The prompt could be, tell me about it, how the Florida panther population has declined over time. And so what they're asking the students to do in the writing test is read, 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 read the question the prompt, synthesize the question the prompt, and then write an essay citing details, and this is something all of the students are doing really, really well, <coughs> citing details from sources that they have read in the, in the writing prompt, in the writing essay. The test itself, it says 90 minutes, minutes with an asterisk. Um, over the last six months, the language on the length of time students have been allocated has softened. Originally it was 90 minutes, <coughs> and then it was 90 minutes with 30, 30 additional minutes if the students need it. Now student, uh, schools can plan to administer the writing test in 120 minutes off the bat, and if students, um, yeah, and if students uh, want to, if you're done, after 90 minutes, if they're done, they can be dismissed, but the student, the school can plan for 120 <coughs> minutes. And while that kind of nuance isn't super important, maybe from your perspective, from our perspective, what it does is it creates the expectation that students have two hours, so they can use that time, and after 90 minutes, if the school wants to dismiss them and move, finish students into the cafeteria or into someplace else, they can, or they can keep them in the room, and that's really left up to the discretion of the school. Um, and so, for the paper-based version, they were for you guys for the for um, it, they it seemed they seemed very comfortable with it. Um, they're moving back and forth. What is profoundly different is the uh, reading passages. It's important to know that you're not going to get a writing score at the end of this year. So last year, if you had a fourth grader and you're a fifth grade parent this year, <coughs> last year you got a score and they were 5.5, or they were a five or a four or a six. Mm -hmm. that, is, that scoring system is no longer in place because that was the old assessment model. The new assessment model gives one English language art score. That one English language art score reflects both the writing and the reading test. <coughs> the writing test is has a 10 point rubric, so the raw score for writing and the raw score for components of reading will be returned to you in June. Um, and you will also receive percentiles and T-scores for your students for all of ELA, but you will not receive a writing score that is not provided by the department. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't the previous writing test an average of three four-ers? 
it depended on which year they took the test. So in some years they had they had two scorers, some years they had one scorer. So so one so what they did is that they had two scores, they would have you know, if somebody gave the student a four, somebody gave them a three, that was a three point five. When students got a three point five, then there were some years they only had one score, so whatever this they got is what they got. Um, this year they have not shared with us how they're going to be. I do believe that there is one for one reader and then an automated process reader. And then a third reader if the, there's a discrepancy between the first two. But I'm not super confident on that. Yes? Who does it? Who does the scoring? Um, in the past, with the FCAT, it was an, a vendor through the Department of Education. So they hire people, you know, Texas, um, they hired a group of people in Texas, and they sent all of our stuff to Texas, and they were scored in Texas, um, and then we would receive the scores. Our staff, our teachers, teachers in Florida, from Florida, do not score the Florida writing or any of the Florida assessments. But if some company hired somebody to do it and scored it. So that's the writing test. Does anybody have any other questions on the writing test? Yes. Um, narrative, exclamatory. Expository. Expository, thank you. And persuasive. Persuasive, thank you. Yes. So which of the three, or does it kind of, you, okay. We won't know. So it would be reasonable to ex expect that within one school, there will be multiple prompts and okay. multiple reading passages. So okay. your child could receive an expository prompt. They could receive a, uh, an ex, uh, Persuasive, persuasive prompt. Thank you. Yeah, persuasive yeah. prompt. I, I've been at schools, not that I've read the prompts because I'm not allowed, but I do know that they do have different prompts at different sites. And within a site. So in reading, as I mentioned, the reading assessment is actually administered at a later date than the writing assessment. So starting on March 3rd through the 10th is the writing assessment. Your school will give you specific information about your school's writing date. But about a month later, but depending on grade level, three and four are, free, are first, <coughs> fifth is later on in April, your students will be taking the reading component of this test. Third and fourth grade students are taking a paper-based version of the test, and they will be taking it earlier in April. Think like the third, the fourth, the eighth, early in April, because those actually have to be sent away for scoring because they are paper-based. Um, what you, as you may know, the state of Florida currently has a statute that requires that any third grade student who is not proficient or not at a proficiency level, a minimum proficiency level, is required to be retained unless they have, we have something called good cause for promotion. And so the third grade test has to be administered early because those, that, those um, test booklets need to be scored and returned to the schools before school ends so that if there is a student who is required to be retained by statute, the school has the opportunity to either provide a promotion for good cause or uh, remediate the student through summer schools. And so that, that does remain on the books for this assessment. Fourth grade is also a paper-based test, so that will be administered early also for scoring purposes. Um, and then fifth grade through 11th grade are all computer-based assessments, um, and they vary in time, but and, uh, obviously the length increases as the grade levels increase. Um, again, as I mentioned, raw student scores will be returned to parents in terms of an ELA score, English Language Arts, and it will be ha will have a writing component and a reading component, and those will be returned to you in terms of raw scores, which is essentially on um, the writing out of ten. Um, the reading could be vocabulary. It's, it's going to be the component parts uh, of the assessment. Percentiles, which are state norm percentiles, these are not nationally norm percentiles, but the percentile how your student did compared to other students around the state. So you're going to see maybe a 79 percentile, which means that your student performed better than on or at or above 78% of the other students in the state because they're at the 79th percentile. And then T-scores, and T-scores is a statistical model that are used for, that are the range is 20 to 80, and those are used by the state in generating the levels. Because you, you're probably thinking, when you think back to last June, and you got your FCAT score reports, you had level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, and level five was the highest achieving student, and level one was a student who needed the most assistance. So this new uh, assessment will not have those levels available until October. So what that means is for parents, for schools, you'll be receiving, they will be able to provide us percentiles. I say October because I, I think it's important for you to know as parents that your schools will not receive a letter grade until next October. Letter grades are determined by the percentage of students who are proficient in reading in English language arts and math and science. And so science doesn't change, so that's not a big issue, but reading and math, it, the state has to set the levels. 
and they will not be able to set the levels until all of the scoring is done. So they won't be able to do that until the summer. So probably it's reasonable to anticipate that they'll do the level setting in July and August. September, they'll take it to the State Board of Education. They'll vote on the levels, the cut scores. You know, what is the range for a level five? What is the range for a level three? What is the range for a level one? They'll, the State Board of Education will approve those in September and they will be applied so to our students and to our schools. So what that means is, in next October, you're gonna receive another sheet of paper with your students' levels. So in June, you're gonna get a report card from our district and you're gonna get student percentiles, raw scores, and T-scores for your student. Um, whether or not 50% is proficient, we won't know. We won't know if 30% is proficient. All we're gonna know is the percentage, a percentile. In October, that's when we're gonna get the levels. What is a level five? What is a level four? What is a level three? Scale score conversions, those kinds of things. Any questions on ELA read? Yes. So how do you promote the student uh, if you don't know the so the only group of students who must be retained because of the state assessment is our third grade students. So those students, are we're going to receive their scores earlier. So we have multiple data points on those students already. So we have programmatic, like grades, the programmatic data points. We have historical data points on students. So we have other kinds of assessments like Ames Web progress monitoring that we do with the students. So for third grade students, that level setting is not going to be a, as big of an issue for retention. The state announced that they're going to give us a cut score. They're going to say if you're below, and I'm making this 25 percentile, the, those students need to be retained. So they're going to define that for us. But we're going to have lots of other data points. And we do have a pro in third grade, maybe in third grade maybe it's bad, but they may get better as they go by. I'm sorry, say it. They may be bad in third grade. As the year passed by, they may get better. Sure. They cannot assess person what they're doing in third grade. Sure, and so I think what I heard you say is that maybe somebody, your student did poorly on the third grade test, but in fourth and fifth grade and sixth grade, they've made the gains that they need to and they're really showing proficiency in their grade level. Absolutely, that happens all the time. Unfortunately, the statute says in Florida, third grade students, if they don't meet a certain threshold, they must be retained, unless they have a promotion for good cause. And your school is already on that. We've been doing promotion for good cause for years. So if a student has a bad day on a bad test, but they've mastered all of the standards. We actually have a portfolio that we create that demonstrates their mastery, and that's what we use to promote them. Um, but that's managed by your school site. I think there was another question. Yes. Sorry, so what is the threshold for third grade? Do you not know that? They, the state has not released that yet. We do not know. We know, that I can fill in a thimble what we know about scoring. The state has not released that information to us yet. Yes, sir. The number of items, number of sessions are going to say that there's a 50, 60, 60 total items? It's a total divided, number of items, yeah. So it would be about 30 items per day. <coughs> so if, you know, just like simple, like kind of thinking, it's probably like five readings with six questions or six readings with five questions, um, which will take the students, 80, and it's 80 minutes. Yeah. So that it is, it is a full testing period of time. You know, 80 minutes seems like a long time, but there is work for the students to do during that time. <coughs> yes, ma'am. There are lots of different types of questions. Um, in third, fourth, and fifth grade, they are multiple choice questions, but they are not multiple choice questions like we are most used to. So there could be a question that's A, B, C, D, and you select the best answer, but there are also questions like select all the best answers. So it's not just. It's not just, so it is multiple choice. I caution you when I say multiple choice because we think back to what we used, are used to and um, that's not the complete picture. Now, your teachers. Yes. Yes. So just so that you know, we, this information about the, mul the types of multiple choice questions has been shared with schools and I believe I was here in September maybe with, with the faculty, going through this with the faculty. So they have been working with these types of items. They've been going to the parent, the resources that we have as teachers um, to prepare our students in our classrooms. Ms. Kelly. We'll send out to you a list or please join uh, the hard practice test. We are modeling our board assessment against look to the Utah test. We don't know if it'll be exactly the same, but that right now has been our best picture of rigor and the types of questions that might be asked. And jump in if I'm misunderstanding the emails. 
your teachers have taken those tests, they're doing question by question with your kids, they're showing your students exactly how to answer those. Because if it's a two-part answer, even if they got one part wrong, they might not get full credit as we're understanding. And That's I'm right. not trying to sugarcoat or bust your bubble. It's gonna be a hard test, okay? But your, te your teachers are showing your kids every possible way to answer and look for those phrases within the test, mm -hmm. question. And I have some samples later on as yeah. we get into it. Uh, I think I have another hand up, ma'am. Well, I, I, I know I read through your thing. It looks like you are going to talk about those types of questions later because that was one of my main questions was what, and I, I know I heard the symbol part, um, <laughs> in reference to if you have a multiple answer, mm -hmm. they I do know this answer. I know what you're going to think. If they get two and they didn't get the third one, and did the answer completely? No partial credit. No partial credit. So if they, if they pick two out of the three, because there's three correct answers, they only pick two, no partial credit. So in the English language assessment, there is, I'll just jump down to it. Okay, so in this example, this is math example, but in this example, in the English language arts assessment, and in the, what is, the question will read, select the values that are greater than or equal to one half. So it doesn't, it's not like multi-select, multi-select, right, multi-select. The point. They're so, not even really telling the child that there's going to be multiple. This answers. is why I'm taking my tour on the road, so that you know as parents. So your students are going to see select the values. And they have to be reading the test. And, and, and on the fifth grade one, it's, it's one item per page, right? Because it's on a computer. And so it's got, it kind of stands, not that I've seen, like I haven't seen it, but I... It would stand out more with just one because they're reading the entire page when they're reading the math question when there's only one thing on the page. So the S in values is going to be the trigger for them to know that it's got to be multi-select. In this example, I think there are three. Do you think I have it memorized by now? But one, two, three possible answers. On the multi-select, there is no partial credit. We do have a question pending regarding in math items, there are... Um, there are part A and part B questions. Mm -hmm. And so our current pending question to the department is in math question, we understand there's no partial credit here, but in math questions with a part A and a part B, can a student earn partial credit if they get part A correct? And is that treated independently of part B? Mm -hmm. And we are waiting to gain clarity on that. And so as we do, we'll get it to the Ms. Keltner and I'm sure she'll share it. But right now for this, I want you to know that the answer is no. Yes, ma'am. I think that you're, well, this is not a, yeah, so this, yeah. I do think that there are teachers who, are, who have modified assessments in the classroom. What I am hearing in my travels yeah. is that teachers are modifying assessments to include one question like this. So Tuesday night I was at a school and the uh, math department person was stood up and said, on my test tomorrow, I've added a question like this. And so while it may not be in the, uh, the adopted <coughs> curriculum, I do believe teachers are and are modifying the, what they're doing in the classroom to capture these things. Amen. <laughs> and base yeah. your child's um, uh, advancement on it. Yeah. Well, again, they would argue that only third grade is. <laughs> <laughs> third grade. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the third grade would be the ones that would have probably the most difficulty with it. Correct. So I do think you know I I think that it's important to know that third grade is the mandatory retention, but we do have the promotion for good cause portfolios. And so I say that enough. And so we that is a mechanism we have been and so we've had the FCAT right FCAT 1.0 became FCAT 2.0 and I've. I mean, we probably all, when FCAT 1.0 came out, there was a lot of heartburn and consternation about FCAT 1.0 because it was we were all taking the Iowa one and we've, it's Florida's been testing kids for years, right? Yeah. And so maybe when we were in school, we took the S, the the SAT 10 or the Iowa or the CBT. And so if you remember back, it was like super easy questions and it was A B C D and that was what we had. And we did that in Florida until the mid 90s. And then about 1996, 1997, that's when we moved to FCAT 1.0, and that caused a lot of heartburn. 
And then about 1998, 1999, not only did we introduce this assessment, but we started grading schools on this assessment. And then about eight, nine, ten years into that process, we realized that there was kind of like a disparity. Students were doing rocking, being rock stars in elementary school, but then when they got to high school, they 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 dropped off, right? They really struggled. They they were fours in fifth grade. By ninth grade, they were a three. By tenth grade, they were a two, and they barely passed the FCAT. And so FCAT 2.0 came out, and FCAT 2.0 was more rigorous than FCAT 1.0, and it included a different type of scoring rubric that made that that actually was supposed to give more accurate performance measures for students in elementary school aligned to the, the high school stuff. So we've had a lot of experience with this. And I share that only to say that we do have mechanisms in place, safety net for students who struggle. So your, your schools have been working on intervention groups. It is an unknown. We don't know what's on the test. Nobody, and I will tell you this, if you go to Amazon.com and search on this and try to buy a test prep booklet, it's not you may be wasting your money only because nobody has seen this test. So it's that publisher's best guess at what's on this test. Well, that's better than nothing. Well, our curriculum has been adopted this year, and our curriculum this year actually is as closely aligned as any one any curriculum out there. And the types, so for example, I think, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not an elementary person, but there's something called cold reads that are done every two weeks. That was implemented this year specifically to support and strengthen students on these kinds of tests. Mm. So if you remember, or you think back to this past year, mm. on every second Friday, your students have been working on under main, main idea. And they've been working on the classroom main idea, they've been reading a passage, a teacher's been reading the passage, they've been underlining, they've been doing strategies, they've been doing work, they've been doing homework, everyone's at their wit's end. And then they come to school on the second Friday, and they've been reading, and I'm making of mice and men for not that they were, but for 10 days, right? And then on the 10th day, they come in and they have an assessment. But now, it's on Grapes of Wrath. And it's all main idea questions on Grapes of Wrath. It has nothing to do with the Of Mice and Men that they've been reading for 10 days. That has been very strategic on the part of our district. Because the idea has been that when the students walk into these tests, they're not gonna have 10 days of pre-reading instruction to support their, and strengthen their skills. So they've been doing all this stuff, they've been working with their students, and then on the 10th day, we've been working <coughs> with our students to transfer the skills that they have practiced in the classroom with a teacher on these cold reads. That has been, from what I understand, not a super, you know, that's been a new way of work for our students and for our teachers. And so we are doing things in our classroom instructionally to support this whole new world of two to five reading, two to five reading passages on a writing test reading passages with all different types of multiple choice questions on a reading test. And then we're not even going to get the feedback on, you know, how they, I mean, we get a sense of how they did on the reading, we get a sense of how they did on the writing, but it's not like we're going to be able to have, you know, a party for the 6.0 kids. Or we're going to be able to have a party for the level 5 kids at the end of the year. Because we don't have those scoring mechanisms in place for this year. Yes, ma'am. And because I have an older child, and affects the scores from this affects what great classes they get put in the following year. When will those? What will how scheduling? Work? How yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've been working on this with exactly. our. Um, so we've been working on this with our secondary folks. So essentially, at secondary level, we really do use levels, the FCAT and one five four three two one, to help with scheduling students into courses. Mm -hmm. Well, we're in a little bit of a pickle because mm -hmm. we're not getting those till October, and they're not delaying right. the start of school. So what we've done is we're triangulating the data. We're using the year's previous FCAT scores, the percentile rank that they're getting from this year's test, and teacher recommendation. Hmm. And so we've got a plan in place, you know. Which is probably a really good way to do it because that doesn't, then it doesn't base it on one. I mean, that's maybe a good idea, just and I know you don't have any control of this, for everything. Looking at past yeah. scores, teacher recommendation, all their work, mm -hmm. and... Generally, it's been like test eight, the current year's test score and the um, teacher's recommendation, mm -hmm. but we're going back a year and we're going to add that mm -hmm. previous year's test score. And so, teacher's recommendation includes classroom grades, work that they've done. So it generally, the way the classroom, the, you know, the teacher initial, so it's not like a form that the teacher fills out, right. but the teacher and their analysis of yes. the students use Overall. the classroom. You yeah. know, a lot, sometimes it's motivation. It's those things that are in, yeah. intangible, mm -hmm. intangible. Trying really hard, that kind of thing. Yeah. How are you going to grade those children? Grade or for those children. They don't have to have that for the people. This is the first year they're getting the uh access. We came in out of state a whole bunch of other parents. We don't have the district of FCAT Yeah. We have to come forth. So I'm trying to figure in the sixth grade. What tool did they 
big one for you to be able to see. Mm -hmm. For placement. So for the, oh, for the, for the sixth grade. Yeah. So they're going to use, the, they'll, well, they, ha they come with a QM folder. Right. And so we do have a history of their test scores and their performance. So we, so we go in, so I used to be an assistant principal, because that's why I can, right? So, and I used to be a principal too. But so we go into the QM folder, we pull it, we, fold, we photocopy it, that test score, and then the teacher has it. In general, when teachers don't have, when the, the student doesn't populate our student information system, we go out to the QM folder and we write it down. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're in, so it's the same thing, it just looks different. So your test was at New York State. Right. Yeah, so that assessment may not be in our database because our database is specific to FCAT, but we all have, fol we all have folders on our kids. <laughs> and so when all else fails, we actually go to the paper filing cabinet, pull it out, and review it. So. And our teachers sign off on those fifth grade um, course registration forms with their recommendation of what level of English, math, so the bottom score is not as good So this is, you'll have this, you can read this. This is the 10 point rubric that I've, I've talked about the 10 point for writing. This is what it looks like for writing. Um, I'm not glossing over it, but it's just a detail that you can have and take with you. Um, we've talked about the major changes. Um, what I haven't mentioned is listening comprehension. So all of the students in grades five through 11 We'll be having a listening comprehension sec uh, listening comprehension questions during their English language arts reading test. Those listening comprehension questions require the use of headphones. So your school's already purchased headphones. The students already use headphones as part of their instructional program, but it's part of the test now. So when they go and they take the test, fifth grade parents, I don't know how, who you are or where you are, but when they go to take the test, they will have a sound check, and then they'll move through the test, and so. On my form A, my question three is a listening comprehension question. Your form D is question number seven. So the students are going to have questions. For those of us who are back in school back in the day when they had the listening comprehension section, mm -hmm. this is very different from that in that it's uh, the teacher's not gonna stand in front and read a sentence and you fill in the blank or you circle the bubble or fill in the bubble. This is gonna be, in other places I've seen it be a reading passage and then a question about what was read to them. Maybe a long one, maybe not a long one, but a passage that's read and then a question that needs to be asked. Yeah. Yes? Will the question be repeated? Can a child actually have that listening part repeated? Um, I have not seen it. I don't know, but I'll ask. Brett, will you write that down? I'll ask the Department of Education. It would surprise me if they couldn't, but I'll confirm that. So they hit the play button. There's like a little sound icon, and they hit that. And so during t training tests, we can hit it multiple times. But I haven't seen that confirmed in writing, and I will do that. Okay, so some other major changes. This is gonna be fun for fifth graders on the computer-based tests. There is now a zoom in, zoom out feature. There is also change your font color feature. So your students will be cha can change their font color. Um, some of their choices include gold on magenta. And so um, it is in the script. The teacher will provide them the opportunity for that accommodation. Um, however, we would encourage you as parents to discourage them from doing that <laughs> because the way to change, so let's say, you know, not that my daughter would ever do something like that, but she would go magenta on pink because magenta, Visual magenta, yellow on magenta because magenta is so pretty. But about an hour into the test, that's going to be really fatiguing on the eyes. It could be And so stimulating. if she had, if she wanted to go back to black, you know, black type on white background, she would have to pause the test. Her test administrator has to log her out, and then she has to re-log log mm. back in. Mm. And so it takes between two, and it's not a huge deal, but it takes yeah. between two and three minutes. It interrupts it. the flow of tests. Mm -hmm. Generally, kids are in the groove by, you know, about 25 minutes into the test. They're in the groove. They're, they're kind of feeling their thing. And so we would really discourage them from do, using the font, the, the font color changer thing. Um, but they can. It is it is available to them. It really is an accommodation available for students with visual impairments, um, and so it, that's why it's there. Yes. Is that explicitly said yes. to the students? Yes. <laughs> yes. So what that has looked like in practice is the script is read to the students, and then the test administrator looks up and was like, "Really." So, you know, you really just want to, we would encourage you as parents, if your child, you know, certainly if they have a visual impairment and this is a necessary accommodation, we want them to exercise <coughs> and test appropriately and use those accommodations. If, however, your child just likes the color pink, like my kid would, <laughs> you know, we would think, we would encourage you to have that conversation ahead of time. Yes, ma'am. Very basic question, but for the reading listening, is it a volume? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
there's actually a check there's actually the sound check that they do that has that in there and so if they can't hear it they have to raise their hand and then someone comes over um, font size is another um, option that they will have to select um, when they're having the directions read to them for the fifth grade computer-based tests and so what that looks like is it doesn't say you know 14 16 18 20 it actually says 1 1.5 2 2.5 2.75 and so it's a magnifier, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so you would, if your child, of course, needs a visual accommodation, we want them to exercise that. But one of the things that I have, we kind of think is happening, if they go up to like a 2.75 magnifier, the entire problem or reading passage won't fit on the mm -hmm. monitor, and then they've got to scroll back and forth, Ew. right? Yeah. So that's not a great, mm -hmm. I mean, we want them to use this, of course, but at the same time, just things to think about. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so they haven't started the test yet, and so this is there's not there are not added time there's not added time in. The part that they get to pick this is in the directions part, which is not the beginning of the test. But so, time hasn't started. But so time so they so they are taking the test so they're having the directions read to. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. In fact, in fifth grade, they go through all this and then they get put into like a virtual holding room. Where they're they're testing they're going to get like a box that says waiting for test administrator mm -hmm. approval, mm -hmm. and so the test the, the teacher in the room <clears throat> is monitoring all of this. Um, so I talked about zoom in zoom out color choices font size. Um, <clears throat> students is responding with many other formats instead of just multiple choice in the past, and that's really for grades um, in middle school and high school. So their types of questions vary more significantly than the elementary types of questions. And so when you ask me the multiple choice question, I'm not trying to hem and haw. Middle school students, high school students, they're going to see things like drag and drop and hot text and these other kinds of question types, item types. But in middle, um, in elementary school, in general, they're seeing multiple choice. It's just not all the multiple choice. Like our multiple, our tough multiple choice question was like Roman numeral one only, one and two only. Remember those? One and three, one, two, three, and four only. None of the above. Right. That's not really what how some of these multiple choice items are constructed. Some of them are. Some of them are straight A B C D. Um, and some of them are more complicated. Um, for the good of the group, and in your uh, on, in your handout, I believe uh, the single page one, that is um, information regarding the FS assessments. There is a link at the bottom of the page that I encourage you to go to. And what that will do, it will take you to the Florida Standards Assessment Portal that is supported by the Department of Education. This is their website. You can actually go in as a parent, and you can log in and take a training test. My word of caution on that, and I encourage all of you to do it. It's an invaluable exercise. My word of caution on that is that the training test is really an orientation to the technology. It is not an orientation to the content of the test. So you're going to see questions, and they're going to be like that. But that's not the kind of questions your children are going to see. You're, that's a simple math multiplication table. And this is a drag and drop, and so they, so they have to solve it, and then they have to drag the items over, the correct number over to populate the boxes on a drag and drop. Um, but the training test will give you a sense of the technology that your students in fifth grade in the elementary level will be expected to do, but if you have children in other grade levels, absolutely get on there because um, fifth, you know, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade reading and math, uh, eighth grade writing, reading, math, eighth grade and above writing, reading, and math, all online. So it'll give you an opportunity. The writing, the writing training tests are less valuable because it's one question. The um, the reading tests are valuable because it'll give you a sense of the split screen because the text is on one side is a split screen. The text is here. They have to scroll through the text. They can highlight in the text, and then what the questions look like on the other side of the split screen and how the scroll functions. Um, those kinds of things. These are for all grade levels, not just fifth grade, but these are all the different types of items students who are taking computer-based tests may experience. Um, your students will not have most of those. Third, third and fourth grade parents, your tests are just multiple choice, and your tests are, um, the, they do have a, a multi-select item on there. Um, your students will be given in third and fourth grade paper-based directions with examples of item types. So they will have that, which is a great resource, but will be two more pieces of paper that they will have to manage on top of the booklet. That's just something to kind of think about. Um, item types include for computer-based tests, 
then this will be in part of fifth grade, is they either have to, if it's an editing task, which is, you know, grammar, then they will have to either replace the incorrect or grammar syntax with conventions of standard written English. They will have to type over it um, or do a drop down menu to change the word or change the phrase to make it uh, correct. Um, in hot text items, we're, dry, we're, we're reading a question and then they're dragging a response to another location. So it's, um, and it's organizing a specific type of question. Are, they, are these all stuff they do when they're in their labs? I mean, are they very familiar with this? So, because this is stuff I am just learning now because yeah. I have to learn the technology. But do in they know this do they, stuff? you guys do Success Maker? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So in Success, so they know it. Okay. Yes, yeah, some of the some of these formats are newer to them, and we are really making an effort to give them as much practice with those newer formats as possible. But a lot of it is similar to what they've done in Success Maker, the drag and drop. And they all so good. The multi-select item, as I mentioned, is on the third and fourth grade paper-based test as well as the computer-based test. Um, open response <clears throat> items, I do not believe, are on the fifth grade test, and they are not on the third or fourth grade test. So we're going to skip that. Um, on the fifth grade test, and it looks a little different from here, are equation items. And so what the question does is it requires the students to actually write the equation but not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So you may have seen some homework come home this year along those lines. You may have heard of students complaining like they can't figure it out. They're, they just have to write the problem down. You know, and you're trying to tell them, you need to solve this. And they're saying, no, I just, the teacher just, <laughs> that's this. And so um, on the training test, and this is just a screenshot of that, there is this tool that the students will have to manipulate to write the equation. This is a K-11, I'm sorry, this is a 5-11 tool. So the elementary one has less stuff on the bottom, but it is a tool that they will be required to use. Um, that is uh, my presentation this evening. Um, your single handout, your, there is a one page handout for you. Um, that is directly from the Florida Standards Assessment website. Um, and so everything I've learned, I've learned from them, or I've been to like, the state's had three meetings, so we've gone, I've gone to all three meetings, and everything I've learned, I've learned on this website. I know, I just wanted to throw out there, I know that the handouts ran out of with um, a number of people who came in. It's hard to take a wild guess at the number, so um, we will make sure, I know obviously you guys have the list served, so we'll make sure that we email electronically the formats um, to Ms. Kautner, or you might already have them. Yeah, so I'll get everything from and then, Jillian and I. We've recorded her presentation on our new website under the second tab, full information, is where we try to put all of this kind of information. And there's a whole page for uh, FSA. And so there's already a lot of information there. We will add this, we will add the videos. So that's kind of your one stop shop for DeSoto specific um, FSA information. We've linked to all the district's kind of one stop um, pages as well. Excellent. Are there any other questions? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Will all of the grades be testing the same week? So, like, thank you for asking that. Eighth grader won't yeah. be testing four weeks later after my fourth grade. So, um, yeah. So they will be testing on different dates. They could be testing on the same date. So gone is this whole. You know, you know. Last year for writing, we had every before eight ten tested on one day. Mm -hmm. We were great. In years past, we had a big FCAT day on the first Tuesday mm -hmm. of the FCAT testing cycle. It was the day everybody knew testing was going to happen. Um, with this new test and this new model and time, the length of time required to test, um, that's not going to happen quite that way. Each We have a district kind of overview calendar, which includes the windows, but the schools really have the flexibility to administer the assessments in a way that makes sense for the schools. So as Ms. Kellner kind of referenced earlier, you have an amazing lab. And so your, your <coughs> computer-based testers in fifth grade can test in one lab. Many schools do not have that luxury. So they're, they're having to take their, at their fifth graders, and they're going to have to test the session one maybe over three days because they only have 30, I'm making 20 computers. That's not true, but you know what I'm saying, right? And so there is going to be, so if you have a niece or a nephew in another school and they're in the same grade as your child, and they're testing on Tuesday and you're testing on Thursday, that's completely reasonable to expect this year. There's, so gone is this idea of what we knew in the past. Everybody tested on the same day and it was causing, so your school will have a calendar 
all your schools will have a local calendar. They've already been working on it. Um, some have published them. Have you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So they should have that posted probably the next week or so, so you will know. Um, and so I uh, just third, fourth, and fifth grade will be doing the, I just happen to know, third, fourth, and fifth grade FSA writing, which is the first test that we have is March 10th, 11th, and 12th. Um, I don't know how you guys are going to do it here, but that's essentially when they start. Um, but high school is starting the week earlier. Their March and middle school is starting the week earlier, in particular because eighth grade requires to be in the computer, and the writing test requires a different setup. And so they'll be testing longer. Do the paper-based kids stay in their classroom? I guess it's school. Those are the accommodations you have come out with special in general, they are. There are a couple of schools that choose to test everyone in like the cafeteria at the same time, but I hear you don't. Okay. I think there's a question in the back and then up here. Sorry. Oh, I forgot up here. Can you hold that? Somebody was before you. I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Um, at an earlier meeting, we were encouraged to teach our fifth graders to type. Okay. And we were trying to get a sense of, are we still on for them needing to learn how to type to take this test adequately? or is it Writing is paper-based. So the writing test that they're taking first is a paper uh, is a paper based test for them this year. So I do think that having typing skills is a valuable skill to have. The reading test and the math test are computer based. Of those two, the math test is not going to have an extended response. They may have a an open response, but it's not going to be like paragraph writing. Mm -hmm. The reading test could have a lengthier typed response. Um, however, I do not anticipate that being a problem for the typing for the students this year. I can tell you that when I've been at the middle schools who field tested, um, typing was a concern that I had. And after watching the students la this last two weeks, they, that was the least of our concerns. Like that should have been. I mean, so they've been. They seem to have worked out whatever. They were not hen. Pe they weren't pecking. They they were rocking and rolling on it. And so that was really kind of kind of a check a mental checklist for me. Like okay, the the kids seem to be doing okay with that. And so for for right now, you should be okay. And kind of just thinking back on that. We did purchase a subscription for our fifth graders this year to a mm -hmm. website called Typing Club. Mm -hmm. They've all been introduced mm -hmm. to it. Our fifth grade teachers have been incredibly supportive mm -hmm. of uh, kind of communicating with kids the value in learning to touch type. And so they can get on that at home. So if you have a fifth grader and you've not seen Typing Club, um, it's hard to fit that kind of stuff into the school day. They've done it some, but that is an excellent thing to have them on at home. That still will help them beyond testing, but it will definitely help them with all this testing as they go through. And, it's on the, and they can get through it through the technology page? Mm -hmm. they, <coughs> it's on the technology page. And there's another one linked there that's for younger students. Um, that we didn't have, It's free, so you can use it. But the typing club that we bought for the fifth graders, and, and we may look at buying that for fourth grade next year when, when writing starts to come down, um, is uh, it's more kind of systematic, and it tracks their progress. So it's, it's really... It's really a, it's and they a, should know their passwords or whatever. Yes, all the okay. <laughs> Great. Not, Thank you. Email. Back in the back. I'm sorry. Okay, so I have a clarification question as well. I wanted to know, like I heard you say writing for third, fourth, and fifth graders, but I didn't see writing as one of the elements on the third grade. I apologize. I should have just said fourth and fifth grade. Writing is for fourth and fifth grade only. Okay. The reading is for third, fourth, and fifth grade. I apologize. I had a question up here, and then do, yes. Yes, and I don't know, this doesn't really relate to this particular site, but what I was thinking was, if you've got a grade level going to the computer at different times, how is the security issue managed? Insofar as? And you were explaining to us that if the school had 20 computers, mm -hmm. then we have set students so, going in mm -hmm. on different days. So security, like the students cheating, sharing the items? Well... So they're not supposed to, and, <laughs> so, and there is very strong, yeah, yeah, you know, there is something called a security agreement, and that yeah. is read to them, and has very forceful language in it. Um, it sounds very intimidating, um, and so that is there, and the students acknowledge that they've been taught this. There is a security program called Caveon Test Security. Um, I, uh, we, we're very familiar with it at the secondary level because it's been running for years behind the scenes. Essentially what Caveat Test Security does is it looks for matches of student answers at the rate of like 1 to 1.1 trillion. And if there is a similarity in answers, it flags the students and the state will not release their scores. So there is an academic integrity component built into the test platform. Mm -hmm. It's managed by Caveat Securities. 
Um, and if you want more information, we've been dealing with that for years at the secondary level, um, but it's not something that Knockwood, I've had to really deal with. That's not a fun conversation to call parents and say their state's not releasing your scores, we have to do an investigation, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, when the students log in to the computer-based test, there's a secure browser. The, uh, the machines cannot have anything running in the background. Literally nothing else can run on the machine when the secure browser is running, or it will not open, it'll have an error message. So even if the student goes, even if the test administrator, who is not taking the test, but goes, tries to go to a website, it'll shut everything down. So the test security is, is, is tied to the browser. Um, as well, students will have unique usernames and passwords that are generated by the school. So their username isn't going to be Jillian Gregory. It could be GR132. And so at the student level, and they're not going to get their usernames and passwords until they get something called a test ticket. And they get the test ticket when they come into their test lab and the teacher hands it to them. And that's part of the script that's read to them. And the paper-based test, I mean, there are multiple passages and different tests. I mean, not everybody's not yeah. getting the same yeah, test. Yeah, they don't all have so, it. Yes, they could talk about you. it, but, yes. you know, the chances of you and I having the same test. Yes, and I can say in the field test, uh, you know, that it appeared that there were many forms and many reading passages and many, there, they seem to be, there seem to be lots out there. Um, there was a question right here. Yeah, I apologize. The, I, the typing has me thinking, and I'm sorry if you already answered this, but you said that in the fall it was uh, decided that fourth through seventh, this is the writing component, fourth through seventh is going to be paper-based. Mm -hmm. Is there, could that change in in, in the, the future, future, yes. Like next year, the so the state has a con an adoption uh, plan or an implementation plan uh -huh. for computer-based tests. And in general, we add a grade every year. Okay. And so if we're doing fifth grade online reading and math this year, it's reasonable to anticipate that next year, fourth grade reading and math will be online. Okay. So it would be reasonable to think that in a year maybe the Probably seventh, seventh grade. grade. Would be doing yes. <coughs> yes. Okay. Now, the, oh, my only comma but on that is that originally when this was rolled out, fifth through seventh grade, we're going to be computer-based. So a question we have pending is, when you move forward, DOE, are you going to the old schedule and we're going to pick up from there, or are you going to go to our more gradual implementation model of one assessment per year? I think that's what made some of us nervous last fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but that has changed, and so the good news is, right, you know, that I think that the, what, the rhetoric I've heard from the commissioner in the last few weeks is that it's one per year. So, I'm sorry, I've taken, no, okay, so I'm going to hang out, yeah. I'll answer individual questions after, and I'll Thank be around. Thank you so much, you wonderful. Thank you.